Hello, heathens, and welcome to Spinning the Wheel Podcast with me, your frosty host, Megan Angus. And this week, we will be discussing Yule season, waning moon in Libra, lunar week 44. Here we go. Okay, we have um, a metric shit ton of uh, stuff to talk about this week. <laughs> So we will be on brand <laughs> when we are hitting the one and a half hour mark. Okay. Uh, <laughs> but um, side note, little shill, thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for supporting this podcast. You do support the podcast, right? Of course you do. But in case you forgot, because I know you meant to, you can... Always join my Patreon as a means of supporting. You can throw me a tip through Venmo. You can also support me through Anchor uh, and subscribe through there once a month if you don't want to mess with uh, Patreon, which is totally fine. Um, but you can also rate this podcast now on Spotify. Uh, you know, five stars is cute. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a cult. It's, a, it's like a spell. But, you know, do what you feel. Um leave a, a review wherever it is, whatever platform it is that you listen to this on. Um, that also is absolutely a means of supporting me and supporting the podcast, as well as sharing it with your friends and loved ones, posting on social media, all that good stuff. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let's get into the stuff. First off, hell yeah, it's Yule season officially. Uh, winter solstice has happened. I'm assuming by the time you listen to this, unless somehow this is being listened to in the past, please let me know. That'd be really cool. Um, if you missed it, I held my Yule live stream on YouTube. You can watch that there. But I also had the opportunity to uh, distribute the video of the class through Spotify and through Anchor and through the podcast platform. So it should have shown up for you. You can also just listen to it if you want to. Um, but check that out if you haven't uh, to get caught up on what we're going to be talking about for the next six weeks or so, which is Yule season, winter solstice season. If you haven't watched the class yet, let me catch you up on our witch's work, which is uh, a return to source uh, themes around death and rebirth, wisdom, and ancestors. And on the global level, we see very similar stuff happening. Uh, we see rebirth, transformation, ancestor work, absolutely. Enlightenment and wisdom stuff, getting lots and lots of emphasis. And the birth or the rebirth or the return of solar and light deities in alignment with this quarter fire festival. So we see that within paganism, modern and ancient, and we see that in lots of other belief systems and cultural practices all around the planet. And it kind of goes without saying, New Year's, right? Kind of a big deal at this time of year. <laughs> Not for everybody, but for lots of folks. And even for cultures and um and countries and different belief systems that use different calendars. The, the Western world is kind of a thing. We're sort of like up in everybody's business. And so by default, a lot of those countries and cultures still pay attention to our calendars, even if they don't actually use them. Um, so this is a New Year's moment. But there's lots of ancient civilizations that put their New Year's on the winter solstice. And the new year for them energetically started and starts as the sun slowly begins to come back to us after its three days of death. What's this three-day thing? Go watch the class, dude. Uh, okay, so that's kind of centering us in the work that we're going to be doing for the next six weeks. And so we're expecting to see lots of holy days that are going to speak to that subject matter, right? And we are going to. Um, but first off, let's uh, get into this particular week. Um, as usual, we're going to be talking about the lunar phases, the astrology, the astronomy, and the holy days, past and present. And our week kicks off with December 26th. Yes, we have made it to the other side of Christmas. Good job, guys. <laughs> All right, let's get into it. All right, our week starts on December 26th. As I just said, we made it through Christmas. We've made it to the other side. Good job, everybody. <laughs> and now we get to go back to, um, you know, wrenching soul searching. No, no, it's, it's, it's not that bad. 
uh, uh, anyways, <laughs> we start this lunar week with a waning half moon at five degrees of Libra. It will be exactly at five degrees at 623 p.m. Pacific Standard Time later in the day and the next day for everybody else around the planet. So what are we doing with a waning half moon or a waning quarter moon? Both are correct uh, in Libra. Well, this moon is asking us to be aware of all of the ways that we pass judgment on people and all of the stuff that influences our opinions about people. Excellent timing after having spent, you know, holidays with the family or not, right? <laughs> When I sat down to do this work, I was like, well, <laughs> isn't that interesting? So you probably, possibly, depending on, you know, who you are, where you are in the world, probably if you're here in North America, you have been subjected to some sort of family, we have to get together, we have to do the thing, thing, right? And, you know, what is that within the context of a worldwide pandemic? That's a lot. Even without the pandemic, the holidays are a lot. And lots of folks don't want to hang out with their family for all kinds of reasons or certain members of their family, or they can only take so much of their family, right? I love them even though they are fill in the blank. Um, and so we've probably had several opportunities over the last week or so to consider our opinions about people, right? <laughs> so not saying that your opinions are wrong, but, um, but what we want to do with this moon is really think about our emotions behind those opinions, where those opinions are coming from. What are we thinking internally when we are passing judgment on, on these people that are around us, whether or not they deserve it. Um, and it's not that we necessarily want to separate our emotions from our opinions. We just want to take a deep dive into that subject matter and like really come into understanding how much our emotions and our experiences influence our opinions about the people around us and the stuff that they do. That's it. I'm not telling you to do anything with that. Just have that conversation with yourself. Like, wow, I was really judging the shit out of Aunt Nancy this year at Christmas. And it's, you know, and it's because, you know, this thing happened between us when I was 12 years old or, or whatever, right? Just let yourself open up that dialogue. Don't tell yourself, oh, I have to do something with this information or I have to make a decision about these things. Just, you know, and this is absolutely not meant to be a, like, let me flog myself because I'm so judgmental. We all judge each other like <laughs> when, when we have time to even notice or pay attention to each other, <laughs> right? About 20 nine hours of my day, I'm very focused on myself. I really don't care what you're doing. <laughs> but in those five seconds that I am looking at you, I am castigating judge. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> JK guys. Um, but yeah, that's what that's what's up with this moon. We're taking an opportunity to have a, an internal dialogue around, you know, what is that narrative that's running in the back of my mind when I look at this person, I look at how they live their life and, and the decisions they make and the things they do or don't do. What am I thinking? And where does that come from? What might be influencing that? That's all. All right. For our lunar body work, we are resting, relaxing, nourishing, supporting, or otherwise restoring our lower digestive organs and systems. And also, hey, great timing. A lot of us eat some wild foods around the holidays. Um, you know, sometimes it's very, very different from what our normal diet routine looks like. Not diet as in dieting, just diet as in your selection of food per day. Um, and the, and the holidays sometimes can introduce a whole bunch of variables to that. So this might be a really nice moment to give your body a little rest and come back to the boring foods that make you feel really, really good. Um, as I say every week on the podcast, I am not a medical doctor or a health advisor of any kind. <laughs> so if you are wanting to incorporate uh, this information around lunar work plus body health, please get with your trusted health advisor and get their opinion first before some 
lady yelling on the internet. <laughs> For our plant body work, when the moon is in Libra, we're doing nothing with the plants, but Libra is all about aesthetics and art and beauty. So maybe this is a good time to spin your plants uh, because the light is very different. So we want to get a, a different side of the plants exposed to the sunlight. This might be a nice time to dust your leaves with a wet paper towel or wipe down um your plant pots or wipe down your plant stands or adjust the decorations around your plants. Anything like that is very, very appropriate. Okay. Now let us move into the astrology of December 26th before we get into the holy days. Um, we just have one transit for this day and it is Mercury and Capricorn sextiling Neptune in Pisces at 20 degrees. So all around, this is actually a pretty dreamy and imaginative aspect. This signature is really supportive for making art, for writing fantasy, for fantasizing, for daydreaming, like that whole space of like mystical, dreamy, ephemeral kind of activities and, and states of being, um, all of that good stuff. This is not a super great day um, for like super clear thinking or like really diligent thinking. So if you do have to do some of that stuff, which, you know, real life does step in and interrupt things every now and then, right? Um, just have somebody else double check the fine print before you sign the contract or whatever it is. Just, you know, get another set of eyes on it. That's pretty much it for the astrology on this day. Um, yeah, that's it. All right, let's move on to the holy days of December 26th. All right, December 26th through January 1st is Kwanzaa. Woohoo! All right, this is an African American and Pan African seven day cultural holiday that celebrates family and community. The name comes from the East African Swahili phrase, Matunda Ya Kwanzaa, which means first fruits. During the holiday, families celebrate with feasts, music, and dance, and end the holiday with a day dedicated to reflection and recommitment to the seven principles. The seven principles of Kwanzaa are Umoja, which means unity, Kujicha Gulia, which means self-determination, Ujima, which means collective work and responsibility, Ujama, which means cooperative economics, Nia, which means purpose, Kuumba, which means creativity, and Imani, which means faith. Also on this day, we have Zarathoft Dizo from our Zoroastrian friends and ancestors. Uh, this is a day commemorating the death anniversary of the prophet Zoroaster. Um, it is an occasion of remembrance with lectures and discussions held on the life and works of the prophet. Attendance at a fire temple is pretty normal for this occasion. Um, and there is no mourning in the Zoroastrian religion, only remembrance and worship. Uh, but yeah, interesting to have this death at this time of year when we are seeing the death and resurrection of our solar deities and solar archetypes. Also on this day, we have St. Stephen's Day from our Catholic friends and ancestors. St. Stephen's Day is the second day of Christmas tide, and that's kind of the 12 days of Christmas, and is celebrated in honor of one of the first Christian martyrs. Um, St. Stephen, who was stoned to death, casual, uh, in Irish, this day is La Fille Stiofane, or I'm, uh, I apologize to my Irish listeners because I, I know that that is not the correct <laughs> pronunciation. <laughs> but what the day means is Ren Day, W-R-E-N, like the bird, Ren Day. When used in this context, Ren is often pronounced Ran, and this name alludes to several legends, including those found in Irish mythology, linking episodes in the life of Jesus to the Ren. People dress up in old clothes, wear straw hats, and travel from door to door with fake wrens, they used to be real, and they dance and sing and play music. So this is another wintertime mummers kind of festival thing, or it, it ultimately became that. Um, but the wren is also uh, connected to the robin, 
Um, and there's a lot of Holly King, Oak King connectivity between those two birds and those two gods. So kind of cool that St. Stephen is somehow uh, woven into that whole thing as well. All right. Also on this day, we have like 147 holidays from the Romans. I was like, calm down, <laughs> you people in the past. What are you doing? Uh, all right, let's get into it. First off, we have a Dies Natalis for the Temple of Diana, as well as a Dies Natalis for the Temple of Juno Regina. Um, so as we've talked about in previous episodes, the Dies Natalis uh, are literally the day of birth. Um, and these were celebrated uh, on a pretty regular basis. And it's literally uh, the day of birth for the temple dedicated to this god or goddess or deity or, or whoever it is that we're talking about. Um, so it would be the day that the first stone was laid or the last stone was laid or something along those lines. Whatever, whatever it was that those folks considered to be the birthday of the temple. And on the Dies Natalis, usually what happens is the whole temple is completely emptied out. It's completely cleaned out. Um, the statue of the god or goddess usually is, uh, you know, cleaned and dressed in a new thing in some way where if they're wearing a robe or a sash or something, usually there's a new one that's brought in. Uh, the fires are relit, the, the fountains are refilled, all that sort of thing. So it's like a refreshing for the entirety of the uh, temple itself. And of course, this is for Diana as well as Juno Regina. We talked about Diana a lot during Sagittarius season. Those two archetypes are very closely intertwined. Um, Diana very closely uh, associated to the moon and hunting, but also being an independent fiery bitch. We love that. All right. Also, <laughs> Juno Regina. And we've talked about Juno Regina earlier in the year, especially during uh, Letha season. Uh, Juno Regina's name literally means Juno the Queen. Um Regina to reign. And uh, Juno is the goddess version of Jupiter. My opinion probably came first. That's usually how that works. Uh, but yeah, that's what's up with that. And so we see a lot of Jupiter um, celebration. Of course, Jupiter connected to Sagittarius as well. Yeah, I know it's Capricorn season, but relax. Um, uh, but Jupiter also is a deity that oversees the end of the old year and the beginning of the new year. So the goddess version of that thing being worshipped now or refreshed now makes a lot of sense for us. Okay, what else is happening on this day? Also from our Roman friends and ancestors, we have uh, the Dies Natalis of the Temple of the Tempestates or Tempestas. Uh, this comes from the Latin word tempestas, which means season or weather or bad weather or storm or tempest. Um, and basically, this was a goddess or a collection of goddesses that personified weather. And at this time of year, in particular, bad weather. So this was the Romans going in and refreshing the temple of these deities that sort of oversaw weather and how it behaved. Um, even things like clouds and rainbows kind of came into the auspices of being thought of as the, the holy deity personification of these weather formations. So that is also happening and also uh, Laurentalia. And so this was an actual dedicated holiday, uh, again, Roman friends and ancestors, um, that specifically was to dedicate, uh, was to honor the layers, which are a kind of domestic genii or, or genii locus, as it were, divinities worshipped in the house and actually kind of of the house, like the, the spirit of the fire where you cook your food, the spirit of the bed where you sleep, the spirit of the floor that you walk on, the literal spirit of the house itself is also being honored and worshipped in this festival, Larentalia. Um, let's see. Worshipped in houses, esteemed the guardians and protectors of the families, supposed to reside in chimney, chimney corners, excuse me. Others have attributed to this, this feast in honor of Aka Larentalia, um, a nurse of Romulus and Remus and the wife of Fastulus, which also makes sense that the founders of Rome or the nurse that helped the founders of Rome might be worshipped or acknowledged at this time of year. Um, 
But yeah, Larentalia was part of a series of ancient Roman festivals and holidays celebrating the end of the old year and the start of the new. And it comes right on the heels of, or right, it's always connected to Saturnalia, which we've talked about. All right, that's everything for the 26th. Let's move on to the 27th. As we move through this week, you'll notice that um, a lot of our holy days are dedicated to a, like a renewing, a refreshing, a cleaning out the old and making room for the new um, and an honoring of place. Uh, that happens this week and it happens uh, next week as well in a lot of our holy days. All right, December 27th. We still have our waning moon hanging out in Libra, so we're do still doing that fun work. We have a no astrology of note for this day, so let us get directly into the holy days. From our Catholic friends and ancestors, we have the Feast of St. John of Patmos, or St. John of Patmos's day. Uh, St. John of Patmos, what can I say about this character? The saintiest of saints, um, really. Uh, this might be the John that um, wrote a bunch of the books in the Bible, might be the John that hung out with Jesus, might be the John that stole your wallet. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> there's a lot of St. John's and there are some factions of Catholics that are like, they're all different people. And there are other factions of Catholics that are like, a lot of these Johns are probably the same John. So saintiest of saints that's really all i need to say about this guy uh he like sainted it real hard when he sainted uh okay moving on to the other holy days of december 27th from our sikh friends and ancestors we have barahimi zong uh this is observed um in december here <laughs> on the fifth day of mangar purnima which is a, a lunar cycle um this marks the coming together of the mangar people to pay homage to their forefathers, their ancestors, or what is locally referred to as Kuldavtas, or the ancestral deities, by performing various religious rituals and rites. In the Mangar language, Barahi means God, Minat or Mi means worship, while Zong means fort. The ceremonies are followed by a number of cultural performances and on-the-spot competitions. It's worthy to note that the first Barahimizong festival was held in 1998, aiming to keep alive the cultural and traditional heritage of the Mangar community. Okay. <clears throat> also on this day, we have the Ige Festival from Nigeria. The Ige Festival is the biggest and most flamboyant of all the festivals celebrated by the Oba people and the people of the Benin Kingdom. It is normally celebrated with a lot of pomp and pageantry. Celebrated between Christmas and New Year's, the festival includes the Oba's blessing of the land and his people. During the Ige Fest ritual season, the Oba is prohibited from being in the presence of any non-native person. The festival is a set of annual cycles of rituals and rites that are performed to purify and strengthen the Oba and the kingdom in preparation for the new year. The Ige festival is actually a culmination of nine different ceremonies, which unfortunately we don't have time to get into now, but really, really cool stuff. Uh, go check it out, actually. There's there's a really cool uh, ritual cycle that they that they go through over the course of the days. It's great. Okay. Also on this day from our Norse friends and ancestors, we have the Feast of Freya. Now, at first I thought that was kind of interesting because I always think of Freya first and foremost as the lady, of course, um, and a goddess associated with beauty and love and fertility and, and you know, gold, right? <laughs> um, her cats, you know, um, sex and death and, uh, or sex and war as well. In that sense, Freya is, is similar to Ishtar, not to say that those two goddesses are connected, but just that they, they do a lot of the same stuff. But then I remembered, oh yeah, Freya also receives half of the slain, uh, battle, you know, battle deaths basically half the half the people that are that die on the battlefield um and she may be connected to the valkyries and so having her here in this darkest part of the year sort of makes sense i i wonder so you know did she over help oversee the death of the sun and its resurrection or something along those lines who knows um or you know that symbolism might not even apply here but 
pretty cool stuff. Um, yeah. So at first I was like, what? Why is she here? Oh, right. She absolutely oversees the dead. That's true. That's true. All right. Cool. Also on this day from our Catholic friends and ancestors, we have the Feast of the Holy Family. The Feast of the Holy Family is a day on which Catholics worldwide celebrate Jesus's earthly family, the divine son of God, Jesus, uh, his mother, Karen, just kidding, Virgin Mary, uh, and his foster father, Joseph. Um, and this is also a great day for celebrating our own families. So here we have another day that's like, hey, go hang out with your family, chosen, biological or otherwise. Also on this day from our Roman friends and ancestors, Brumalia ends. Brumalia is a month long festival. We started talking about this a month ago, back in November. Um, it means winter festivals. It was an ancient Roman winter solstice festival honoring Saturn, AKA Cronus, as well as Ceres, AKA Demeter and Bacchus in some cases. And we've seen over the last few weeks, am amidst all this death imagery and all of this winter time, frosty, chilly imagery and all of these death gods and goddesses and transition gods and goddesses, there also has been this little thread of acknowledging and worshiping plant deities and deities that oversee fertility and vegetation and abundance and all of that stuff. Um, and I just love that. I love that like in the darkest part, we're still thinking about the seed that we're going to plant. And uh, to me, a lot of that symbolism is uh, you know, the light of summer being brought into the darkness of winter and whatever the wisdom and enlightenment of winter is, we are putting into those seeds that we are going to then grow and ultimately harvest from in that next energetic cycle that's coming in the future. That's just how I see it. <laughs> um, this was a festival that was celebrated at least until the 11th century, by the way, <laughs> in Constantinople. Um, it butts up against Saturnalia. It's absolutely connected to that, that whole collection. So, uh, you know, all of these are sort of kind of connecting together. Um, the waxing of the light. The festival included nighttime feasting, drinking, merriment. During this time, prophetic indications were also taken as prospects for the remainder of the winter. Um, yeah, so lots of cool stuff here in Brumalia coming to a close. All right, let's move on to December 27th. All right, December 28th. I think I just said December 27th, but I lied to you. It is We're now moving on to December 28th. Okay. <laughs> and our waning moon is entering the sign of Scorpio. So building on the work that we were doing over the last couple of days with this waning Libra moon, considering our opinions and where they generate from and our beliefs about other people and that whole like internal dialogue that we have with ourselves and all that stuff. As the moon moves into Scorpio, we take a step back with that work and kind of apply that whole conversation to reality in general or our reality in general. What are your personal subjective opinions about the world and reality? And how have your emotions and your personal experiences influenced those opinions? Now, especially where we want to dig in on this is where our thoughts and our opinions about reality are very different from what other people might believe up to the point of being labeled quote unquote crazy for believing it. What are the things that you believe about reality or things that you think are true about the world that you think other people would not only not believe, but would think you were odd for believing that? <laughs> are there realities that you can see or feel that others can't? Is another way to kind of ask myself that question or to consider this subject matter. Right now, again, when we're doing it in the Libra version, it's this, it's very subjective. It's still very subjective here. We're not saying that it's right or wrong to believe any of this. We're not saying that it's true or false. What we're saying is, what is the stuff that I believe in 
that if I told other people, they would go, oh, really? And like pull their kid a little closer. <laughs> Probably a lot, honestly, let's be real. <laughs> and, you know, another way of asking ourselves that is, you know, are there realities that we can see or that we can feel that other people can't? And again, if we were to try to explain it to them, they would look at us like we were, you know, not all there, right? <laughs> and a screw loose or what have you. So that's the work that this moon in Scorpio is asking of us to do. And we have a few days to work on that. Again, just like with the Libra thing, we don't want to come at this with any kind of determination, like, and so I have to act on this. This is much more explorative than it is judgmental than it is like, um, and so I need to make a move here or there. I mean, we may be called to do that, but in this moment, I encourage you to just reflect on that work. Okay. With our lunar body work, when the moon is in Scorpio, we are, excuse me, the waning moon in Scorpio, we are resting, nourishing, supporting, relaxing, or otherwise restoring the sex organs, the pleasure organs, the reproduction organs, and the waste organs and the systems that are connected to that. Um, you know, again, coming on the heels of possibly eating lots of wild and crazy stuff for holiday season, this could be kind of the final countdown for, <laughs> for our digestive system to release and let go. But we also can use that process as vulgar and base as that sounds as a means of processing and letting go whatever may have come up with family or weird work situations or weird world situations as we have been dealing with the holiday season. Okay. And for our plant body work, we are planting, transplanting, or grafting to support below ground growth for our plant friends. What's the astrology for this day? Well, let's get into it because why not? We have just a tiny little thing, uh, not a big deal, guys, just Jupiter entering Pisces for the first time in 12 years. Yeah, the first time in 12 years. <laughs> um, okay, so what do we have with Jupiter in Pisces? Well, let me say first and foremost that there is more to say about this transit than what I can fit into this podcast, because it's a lot. Um, but TLDR... Uh, Jupiter is the ancient ruler of Pisces. Uh, the modern ruler of Pisces is Neptune. We'll talk about that in just a second. But the ancient ruler of Pisces is Jupiter. And Jupiter feels very at home in Pisces. So what does that mean? Well, all of the things that we can come to expect from Jupiter are going to be magnified and multiplied while it is transiting this sign. So let's talk about the hard part first, because that's how we do it. That means overdoing it, over committing, over extending, all that kind of stuff, over risking. These are all on the buffet table and nobody is stopping us from going to get more. But what's the cool part? Well, the cool part means uh, you know, it also means that optimism and generosity and connectivity are also getting a really big boost right now. Jupiter is very fraternal. Uh, Jupiter is very gregarious. Um, Jupiter is very optimistic and is like, yes, absolutely. Yes, more. Why not? Um, and, you know, there's lots of reasons in our world right now for why not, unfortunately. So, uh, so we, we're going to have to find a way to sort of balance the bigness with some type of realism. But there is this very beautiful, generous, mystical vibe that comes in with Jupiter hanging out in Pisces that is super duper cool. Um, what I'll say about it is this. Choose wisely and leave room for seconds. <laughs> okay. The only other thing that we have to talk about on this day is the heliacal rising of the fixed star Kaus or the fixed stars Kaus, uh, Australis and Borealis. Uh, these stars mark the top and the bottom of the archer's bow in the Sagittarius constellation. The traditional name Kaus Borealis comes from the Arabic word Kaus, which means bow, and the Latin word Borealis, which means northern. Um, and interestingly, uh, this star in particular at the north 
part, the top part of the bow is associated with Ishtar. So here's Ishtar imagery sort of creeping in again, interestingly enough. Also on this day, we have another Feast of Freya. This is from our pagan friends and ancestors in the modern world. This is a day that you will see marked on a lot of the modern Wheel of the Year calendars that pagans have on their websites and around. Um, as I said, you know, the Norse day puts it a couple of days before or day before. Um, and either way, uh, when it comes to the pagan holidays, we've talked about this a lot. I love that people have attempted to build and rebuild and fill in blanks and stuff like that. Um, it's a fine time to worship Freya. There's nothing wrong with it. It's also a fine time in spring and summer to worship Freya or to work with that goddess or just even to study her and read about them. Um, but this is a fine time too. Is it absolutely historically accurate? I don't know. But, but does it matter? <laughs> Let's move on to December 29th. Okay, December 29th, our waning moon is still hanging out in Scorpio, so we are still doing that dance along the edge work. <laughs> Check that song out. It's a super old song by a band called Concrete Blonde, and it kind of kind of fits the vibe. Um, so we still have that going on in the background. Um, but then we have some astrology for this day, so let's talk about it. First up, we have Mercury conjunct Venus retrograde in Capricorn at 24 degrees. Okay. So mostly what this feels like is this. On a day like this, we are just having super duper Venusian subject matter on the brain. <laughs> That's really what it is. Our brain, Mercury, is like, I just want to think about pretty stuff. Thank you. <laughs> so we might really want to be, um, you know, making art or looking at art or being beautiful or engaging beautiful things or being in beautiful environments or being around people that we feel are beautiful. Um, you know, we might really want to like immerse ourselves in poetry or music or any of that kind of stuff. It's all totally totally appropriate for this. You might also um, on this day find it much easier to put your emotions into words and or you might really want to talk about your emotions. You might want to talk about love and relationship stuff with people. Um, and this combination lends uh, a very interesting capacity also to be able to see the patterns running through our lives, which is really cool at this time of year. We have a, a, a bit more astrology in the week that is going to culminate in a, a really cool opportunity for sort of looking out and making your blueprint for this next year. And it's starting with this Mercury conjunct Venus, sort of bringing, into this, bringing us into this place of beauty and seeing the patterns, as I said, running through our lives. Um, and if that information should come through for you on this day, it is going to absolutely be useful later in the week. But if nothing else, make some art on this day. That might be the way that some of this information wants to express itself. Okay. Also on this day, we have Mars in Sagittarius, sextile Saturn in Aquarius at 11 degrees. Now, in general, this transit lends us a really cool, patient, diligent energy. So if there is a project in front of us that requires us to like sit down and work on it for a while, this transit is like, yes, I am here to help. <laughs> what, what do you need me to do? It is a great transit for planning things that have a lot of parts, as well as executing projects that require a lot of concentration and a lot of diligence and a lot of patience. This is not a super high energy transit. So that's unusual for a Mars transit. Normally, if Mars is transiting something, it's like, yes, go, set it on fire, woo. <laughs> this Mars plus Saturn is like, no, there's no woo here. <laughs> We're not wooing right now. <laughs> Turn down the woo. <laughs> um, but uh, it is about us patiently getting the thing done. And that might also, again, you know, I know that not everybody is doing the Christmas time holiday thing, but lots of us have celebrated some kind of a holiday 
this month, or we have been dealing with other people doing that stuff. Maybe our work schedules have been really wacky. And so this could be a really fantastic day to come back into your home and clean and organize and get your laundry done or go through your checking account and pay your bills. I mean, I know that stuff is not super exciting, but it has to get done, right? And Saturn loves that stuff. And so here Mars and Saturn are together. That's like, yeah, the chores. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> but this transit also has another interesting side effect, just like the previous transit had a really interesting side effect in that it can help us see where in our process or where in our life in general, we can get along with less. Now, this, of course, can go into like a weird self-denial thing, but let's not do that. <laughs> don't don't do that. But we do want to combine this with that Mercury conjunct Venus thing also happening on this day. Also, we have Venus retrograde in Capricorn, right? And that whole process is us kind of reviewing our values and how we value ourselves and what we value and all of that. So this whole really dope combination of, of aspects is sort of giving us a plateau to kind of stand on and look out at these patterns in our lives. And this could be a really cool day for you to sort of think about and open up to abundance for yourself through renegotiating patterns that are currently happening in your life that maybe are wasting your energy. Um, you know, what can you do without? And what deserves your investment for the long haul? right? This isn't just necessarily about cleaning out the closet and saying no to everything. It's about saying yes to the things that are actually in alignment with your values. And this Venus retrograde is really giving us an opportunity to kind of examine that. I really want to talk about that more. So I don't know, teaser, uh, but I think I might do a, th a little thing, a little talk about Venus and retrograde through the houses for, for patrons. If I don't, sorry, but I think I might want to because it's a pretty cool transit. Um, okay, so I'm just putting that out there that this day could be a really great day to just make some art and align yourself with beauty and think about cool stuff, whatever. But like also it could be a great day to diligently and patiently apply yourself to some stuff in your world that needs to get dealt with slash looking out at your future and kind of thinking like, wow, where could I really refine where I put my energy and get even further in my life than what I'm already doing. Okay. The only th holy day that I have to mention on this day is from our Catholic friends and ancestors and is the day of holy innocence. And this is the day, no big deal. It's just the day that uh, King Herod chops up a bunch of boys looking for Jesus. You know, the Bible. <clears throat> All right, let's move on. And now a brief word from our sponsor. That's me. Uh, if you love this podcast, you can support this work through Patreon. Thank you to all my patrons who help me pay rent every month. <laughs> you can leave a review on your podcast service, uh, wherever it is that you listen to this. And if you are feeling especially hedonistic, you can give it a rating, uh, you know, Five stars is actually the, the most occult rating that you could possibly give. Um, also, I have mentioned this for the last several weeks, but I swear to God, this is really happening. Um, I will be announcing some workshops and some standalone classes in the new year, uh, both on tarot as well as paganism and witchcraft. These classes will be limited entry. Uh, my patrons will have first access to sign up and then folks following the newsletter. And then I will announce them publicly on social media and my website. Um, I will be rerunning the six week Welcome to Tarot workshop. It was super fun. I'm very excited to teach it again. It is um, a dope workshop, if I do say so myself. Uh, and then I will be following up that workshop with four standalone single day workshops. I'm expecting them to be two hours a piece, probably maybe closer to three hours a piece. Um, and we will be talking about material that certainly is going to build off of what is in the workshop, but you won't have to take the workshop to be able to understand what's going on in the four standalone classes. And then I will also be offering 
some more in-depth stuff than what I already have offered in terms of witchcraft and paganism, but I don't want to say any more now. <laughs> All right, that's the end of the ad. Leave a rating, goddammit. Thanks. All right, that brings us to December 30th, and here we find our Scorpio moon has actually moved into the balsamic phase, and it is balsamic at 8 degrees of Scorpio at 528 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, later in the day for everybody else around the planet. Now, let me remind you that when we are working with our balsamic moons in any sign, the balsamic moon helps us see into the future. In fact, our future forms are kind of tugging on us when we are in the balsamic phase. Is like, you know, hey, come on, let's change, let's change, let's get through this new moon thing and get on to the next process. And so, as I said earlier in the podcast, we have several things astrologically, astronomically, holy day wise, really supporting us taking a moment to clean out, reset, and look into the future um, and to get a sense of our big plan and some of our granular, smaller plans, um, all of that stuff. So I absolutely love this. Okay, so we're moving into this balsamic moon in Scorpio. We are looking into the future, but this moon is also about looking into the past and really sitting with ourselves. Um, we have worked with the balsamic moon in Scorpio for the last two months. This is the third time we are experiencing the moon in this phase. And it will be the last time, I believe, until next year, fall. Um, and, and it's a potent, potent lunar phase. Um, and so here we are again. And in this phase, in this, what the work that we're doing is we are truly considering that life, death, rebirth process for ourselves. Either times when we have faced profound transformation or considering if we haven't faced it, what would that be like? Um, and this is also a really great time to do work for people in your community and in your life who are perhaps still reeling from the after effects of a profound transformation, um, of profound physical transformation, mental, spiritual, emotional, you know, cancer survivors, divorcees, our trans folks who go through surgery, um, you know, like all of that kind of coming in, as well as, again, those places in our lives where we have gone through really visceral, profound, gnarly change and have seen, you know, some ugly stuff in the world, and that that has forced us to adapt and transform ourselves to be able to live, really, right? <laughs> um, you know, things that have resulted in PTSD, things that have resulted in trauma, that stuff, it's a it's a it's a funky moon. This is the last time that we're going to deal with this, but this is a time of reflection of those places in our lives, those moments in our lives, as well as reaching out to people in our friend group, in our family, in our community who may still be reeling from the after effects of those types of really harrowing um, transformations and transitional periods. Okay. For our lunar body, with this moon in Scorpio, we are still relaxing, resting, nourishing, supporting, and restoring the sex organs, the pleasure organs, the reproduction organs, and the waste organs and systems. For our plant body, we are planting, transplanting, or grafting to um, support below ground growth. Okay, let's move on to the astrology of this day. We only have a little bit and it is super casual Mercury conjunct Pluto. <laughs> now this is going to happen once a year, at least once a year. Okay. So in that sense, it's not that big of a deal. It is interesting that it's happening on the same day that the moon is balsamic in Scorpio, Pluto being the planetary ruler of Scorpio. Huh, I'm sure it's just a coincidence. Uh, this is in Capricorn at 25 degrees in case I didn't say that. Um, and so what do we get with this transit? All right. It's, neutrally speaking, intense mental activity. Your thinking in your communications with others um, has like an intense penetrating quality. We can be very deep, very like 
um, investigation vibe centric. Uh, the mysteries, we're answering questions on this day. We're doing research on this day. And our thoughts and our words can be extremely influential on other people on this day. And or we might be on the receiving end of that and be around a person whose thoughts are extremely influential or their words are very intense and influential. And so, you know, all of that is lovely. All of that is great. We just don't want to get manipulated and we don't want to manipulate other people. Right. So if you're in a moment where you're like, wow, I'm really swaying people with what I'm saying. Let me be present with what I'm saying and make sure that I actually stand by all these words. I'm sure it'll come back to me later. <laughs> so, you know, and conversely, if I'm standing there, you know, listening to somebody speak and I'm like, wow, I'm really getting swept up in this person's vision of the world. Do I need to take a moment, right? What do I always say on the podcast? You always are allowed to put yourself in time out. And so sometimes that is, that can also be a, a moment of like, whoa, I'm really getting swept up into this person's vibe or worldview or whatever it is. Let me separate myself for a second, take a breath, go pee, have a drink of water, and then come back to this and see if I'm still feeling it. Um, that's what's up. Okay. We just want to make sure that we have always got one toe on the shore as we are plunging into the depths when it comes to any of our work with, with Pluto. We want to make sure that we are always keeping one little elephant butt hair of reality woven into our situation. <laughs> and then later in the day, the moon moves into Sagittarius. And I'm actually not going to talk about that on this day. I'm going to talk about it for tomorrow, December 31st, even though we have a ton of other things to talk about. Okay. Uh, but now let us get into the holy days of December 30th. All right. On December 30th, we have the heliacal rising of the fixed star Fasces. Uh, Fasces is a nebula, not actually just a single star, in the face of the archer, aka the constellation Sagittarius. This is also called M22 or Messier 22, and it has a planetary nebula and two black holes. No big deal. We just find literally everything in the constellation of Sagittarius. Yeah, I'm not going to let it drop, okay? I'm not going to let it drop. <laughs> also on this day, from our Nepalese friends and ancestors, we have Tamu Losar, and this is Nepalese New Year. Um, this has always been in alignment with winter solstice, and it is scooched ever so slightly to match the, the current calendar now. Um, we will talk more about Nepalese, Chinese, uh, Asian New Year stuff for this time of year in just a second. Uh, also from our Greek friends and ancestors on this day, we have Haloa. This is the festival in honor of Demeter Haloa as well as Dionysos, named after the Halos, a.k.a. the threshing floor. Little is known about the specifics of this festival, but we do know that it honored Dionysus and Demeter and appears to have been a fertility rite. It was celebrated with a feast likely held at Eleusis with genitalia-shaped cakes, but without the foods forbidden in the Eleusinian mysteries. After the feast, women danced around with a giant phallus, leaving it offerings and engaged in quote unquote, ritual obscenity. That's a circle jerk, my dude. Just, in, just enjoy, just like lather up and enjoy. Okay. Men possibly also held a separate festival honoring Poseidon. I'm sure they did. <laughs> it's better down where it's wetter. Take it from me. Boop, boop, boop. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I love this stuff, man. The Greeks were just like, can we, can we set it on fire and ritually have sex with it? Lovely. <laughs> Put it on the calendar. <laughs> All right, let's move on to December 31st. Okay, that brings us to December 31st. We have a lot to talk about for this day, so strap in. <laughs> okay. First off, let us start with this balsamic moon in Sagittarius. It flipped into Sagittarius last night, but it was pretty late, so we're going to talk about it for today. Um, okay, and so now, as I said, this moon has moved into Sagittarius, and we are going to continue to build on the work that we have been doing all week with our, our lunar process. So let me let me take you back. 
we started out with our Libra moon, right? And we were looking at our opinions about people and how our emotions influence that stuff and how we really feel about our judgments that we pass on people. And then as the moon moved into Scorpio, we sort of turned that examination toward our personal reality and the stranger beliefs that we hold and opened up a dialogue with ourselves around that stuff. Also, while the moon was moving through Scorpio, we took some time to recognize some of the extreme or visceral experiences and transformations that we have personally experienced and how they have rattled us, right? Experiences that would possibly support believing in some wild or grim realities because we experienced some really intense things and some harrowing transformations. And now we know for a fact that some of these extreme realities are actually true or at least possible. See how all of that connected together? Okay, so now we move into the sign of Sagittarius. And Sagittarius is always connected to the spiritual, the mystical, the shamanic, the magical, the pagan, the priestly. And so here with this moon in Sag, we are coming into a place of not just accepting, but honoring the mundane, the grim, the spooky, the funky, harrowing, extreme, grim experiences and the transformations as our holy trip. We're coming into honoring that work and the vision it gives us and the capacity to see more than other people because of what we have experienced. And here is where that Libra work comes in. If we are harboring unexamined opinions about other people, that's going to come up in our magical work. If we are harboring unexamined judgments around people, that's going to come up in our spiritual work. Um, it's, it's, it's like the universe is going to make damn sure to continue to put us in the other person's shoes over and over and over again to test that stance, to test our opinion about the thing. And again, coming back to that, it's not that the opinion is wrong or right. It's examined or it's unexamined. Because if I, ex if I have an opinion about somebody and I examine it deeply and I'm ultimately like, yes, I still feel that way about that person. Even when it comes up from the universe, I'm going to be like, okay, well, what's the lesson here, right? Because I've had a conversation with myself about what's going on here. Is this more about me? What's, what's going on? But I can be present for the conversation. And that, of course, is really what Sagittarius wants from us is like, be present for the mystical conversation. Be, be here for this thing. Okay. I feel like a lot of the work that we do when we are in Sag season or like a Sag moon day or we're having like lots of planets move through Sagittarius is that we are learning to see the sacred in everything and everyone and making space within ourselves for how irrational that is, as well as the cognitive dissonance that that creates, right? So we're not stepping away from the crazy. We're not stepping away from the irrational. We are making room for that. And isn't that something that we talked about over and over and over again, moving through Samhain season, especially Sagittarius season, was making room for chaos, making room for the changes that are unexpected, that are unforeseeable, that are unavoidable. And especially so when those changes are horrifying, when they are um, shocking, when they don't make any sense at all. And understanding that those pieces of our lives are not to be avoided. They're actually to be embraced and held up as this is where I get my holy wisdom. Remember all of our symbolism around the serpent holder that we talked about, the serpent handler that we talked about so much in the, the, the spirit, the, the um, archetypal symbolism of Sagittarius and Chiron and Ophiuchus, um, this idea of the wound is the medicine. The pain is the medicine. 
we'll hear this moon is really bringing us into how what that looks like for us on a very personal level. What are these wild things that I've experienced in my life? And how does that bring me into how I interpret reality and move through it? Can I see these things as holy? And then ultimately, can I turn that back around to the other people in my world and say, you know, maybe I have had some judgments against you and how you see the world and how you move through it. But I bet you didn't end up here by accident. <laughs> I bet you ended up being the person that you are through a very specific series of events. And now how do I feel about all of that stuff? Just that, just that, <laughs> just that. All right. When we are working with this waning moon in Sagittarius for our lunar body, we are resting, relaxing, nourishing, supporting, or otherwise restoring the sciatic nerve family, the lower back and the thighs. And as I say, always like check with your healthcare advisor before you ever listen to some crazy lady on the internet yelling about stuff. But Sagittarius rules the thighs and the sciatic nerve family. And so we want to be resting and supporting that whole portion of our body. For our plant body work, we are pruning. We are checking for pests and disease as we move into the heart of winter. Um, weeding and plowing, if that is appropriate for you. And harvesting for below ground support um, or below ground plants. Uh, I know lots and lots and lots of stuff is not available for harvest at this time of year. But this might, you might start to really see some production from your winter crops starting to kick in around this time. Okay, that is everything for our lunar work. And now we're going to move into the holy days of December 31st. All right, and now here begins the marathon of 473 holy days placed on December 31st. <laughs> It's not that bad, but it is a lot. <laughs> All right, let's begin with, it's New Year's Eve. Da, 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 da. I don't know if you've ever heard of this, but it's a thing. <laughs> Um, I list this as a global holiday because there are so many people that follow this calendar around the planet. It is, as we have said many, many times on the podcast, certainly not the only calendar that people follow, but it is very influential in our world. So literally all over the planet, somebody somewhere is celebrating New Year's Eve. Uh, on December 31st. Fireworks, champagne, sequins, you know the gig. All right. Also happening on this day from December 31st through January 4th from our Zoroastrian friends and ancestors, we have Vohumana. Vohumana is the Avestan language term for a Zoroastrian concept generally translated as good purpose or good mind or good thought, good thinking, referring to the good state of mind that enables an individual to accomplish their duties. So here at the very end and beginning of the year, um, this, this collection of folks are really encouraged to sort of focus on this good mind, good thinking, good purpose going forward. Right. And we've we've or we have a lot of that stressed in um, our Kawanza stuff as well, which I think is really cool. Also here on December 31st in the United States, we have Watch Night. Watch Night, also called Freedom's Eve, um, is a Christian religious service held on New Year's Eve and associated in many African-American churches with a celebration and remembrance of the Emancipation Proclamation, which was enacted on January 1st, 1863 which freed st slaves in the Confederate States during the American Civil War. Many mainline Protestant churches in the United States sponsor a watch night service on New Year's Eve. It's really popular with Methodists and lots of other folks as well. Um, pretty cool. Also on this day, we have the Feast of Yemaya from our Yoruba friends and ancestors. Um, as we've talked about a few times, Yemaya has lots of feast days. Her biggest feast days and festival times uh, happen in that first week of September, but New Year's is also a time regionally that we see festivals dedicated to her. From our Creole friends and ancestors in Nolens, we have Réveillon. Back in the early 19th century, New Orleans Creole families would go to Midnight Mass on Christmas Eve or Christmas morning slash New Year's Eve, New Year's morning. Um, and having fasted for the previous 24 hours, uh, they were a little peckish. And so atoned but hangry, they would return home to a lavish middle of the night feast. And so, yes, your 2 a.m. 
stumbling home under the influence of whatever it is you kids do these days, uh, and you snag that Seattle dog street meat, that's a holy moment, guys. Okay? That's actually a holy moment. <laughs> Réveillon. Uh, I hope to uh, join in on that at some point. All right. Also on this day, we have the Feast of Oseyin from our Yoruba friends and ancestors. And we also have the Feast of Aroni. Um, and both of these deities are uh, deities associated with plants, vegetation, and specifically culinary and medicinal herbs. They both are known to stand on one leg. Aroni is actually referred to as the lame one. Um, they usually are carrying a cane or a staff or a crutch, and they both chill in the groves and the forests and the orchards of the communities that they are worshipped in. Also on this day, from our Gnostic friends and ancestors, we have the Feast of Father Time. Father Time is a personification of time, really. Uh, in recent centuries, he is usually depicted as an elderly bearded man, sometimes with wings, dressed in a robe, and usually carrying a scythe or a sickle and an hourglass or some other type of timekeeping device. And um, what's interesting is that that depiction absolutely connects them to the ancient Greeks uh, and the ancient Greek depiction of chronos, which is the Greek word for time, but also was an agricultural god, chronos. Uh, who, you know, carried the harvester's sickle. And Rome, Romans, equated Kronos with Saturn, who also had a sickle and was treated as an old man, often with a crutch. Wait a minute, didn't we just mention a crutch? What? Sure, it's just a coincidence. Uh, he may have also had an attribute of a snake with its tail in its mouth. What? <laughs> it's like, uh, what are we, witchcraft? Yeah, that's it. So the Feast of Father Time, of course, that makes sense here at New Year's that we are talking about a deity or an archetype that oversees the passage of time on this very important number counting day where one counting method is ending and the new counting method is beginning. All right. Also on this day, we have from our Japanese friends and ancestors, Omisoka. This is a Japanese traditional celebration held on the last day of the year. Traditionally, it was held on the final day of the 12th lunar month, which means, of course, it could move around quite a bit. But with Japan's switching to using the Gregorian calendar at the beginning of the Meiji era, December 31st is now used for the celebration. Traditionally, important activities for the concluding year and day were completed in order to start the new year fresh. Some of these include house cleaning, repaying debts, purification, like driving out bad luck or evil spirits from the house, but also bathing. Um, and in those final hours of the year, specifically bathing so that you could be spent those last hours you would spend relaxing, which I freaking love. <laughs> Recently, families and friends often also gather for parties or head to the local Shinto temple for ritual at the temple. Um, so lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of observances around the world on the 31st. I'm sure I have missed dozens, um, but that's just some of the ones that are out there. All right, moving on to January 1st, which also, surprise, surprise, has a whole bunch of holy days connected to it. <laughs> okay, before I get into the January 1st stuff, I want to say this. <laughs> Duh. <laughs> Hence why I'm speaking. <laughs> Um, but this is a, a spell that I would like to offer you to work on New Year's. And you can use this on uh, the Gregorian calendar New Year's. You can use this on any New Year's that you like. Um, it's very simple, very straightforward. And uh, if you're like, well, what do I do about it? Just make it up yourself. Don't worry about it. But this is it. What I would recommend as a spell for a New Year's moment is to get yourself a, a nice piece of um, stationery. But, you know, if you've just got like 
the post-it notes that you keep in the kitchen to write down your grocery list, that's fine too. Don't sweat it. But you're also going to want an envelope that seals. So what, however, if you have to tape it shut, whatever, but an envelope that completely seals. And then I want you to write a letter to yourself as if it is next year. So this year, when I do this spell for myself, I am going to be writing as if it is the end of 2022. You get me? Okay. So I'm writing as if I'm in the future, talking to myself in the past. And I'm talking about, this is what I'm going to write down in the letter. This is the spell. I'm talking about everything that happened in the year 2022. Um, and I'm having whatever conversation I need to have with myself, right? Looking back, quote unquote, on the year 2022, what would you say to yourself? Speaking from the future, that's the spell. Then if you want to put magical sigils on it, if you would like to anoint it with some essential oils, all of that, pass it through the smoke of incense, all of that stuff is totally appropriate. You don't have to do any of those things if you're not moved to, doesn't matter. Um, and then fold it up, make sure that you can't read your writing from the outside. So maybe add an, a second piece of paper if you need to, and then put it in the envelope and seal the envelope, like seal it, seal it. If you want to put sigils on the outside or ma magical symbols, if you want to anoint it, if you want to pass it through smoke, again, all those things totally appropriate, ring a bell over it, sure, help yourself. If you don't want to do any of that or doesn't feel right, don't do it, don't worry about it. And then put this envelope someplace important to you. It doesn't necessarily have to be pinned up on the wall directly above your computer where you work. So it's like this haunting reminder every day, the envelope, dun dun, you know. But, uh, you know, like I've kept my envelope on my altar all year. It hasn't necessarily been in the most prominent spot, but it's always been in the mix of stuff on my altar. And then next year on New Year's, read your letter to yourself that you wrote a year before. And write another letter to yourself for the following year. Uh, you know, if you're a person that loves to go party on New Year's, God is blessed, who doesn't, um, do it in the morning. You know, do it earlier in the day when you have some time to sit down and be with yourself, light a candle, put on your favorite music, you know, whatever, make it cool. Um, if you want to make a big old ritual out of this and build an altar and make special incense for it and like really go to town and like have that be your night is this ritual, cool. If you want to have it be a little five minute thing that you pause, you know, get this done, get it out of the way, and then you move on with your day, that is also totally appropriate. Um, but I just wanted to share that with you because it's one of my favorite spells for New Year's. And I always do it with this calendar, not the winter solstice moment, but with this calendar, because this calendar, you know, rules a lot of my physical world life. So it's my way of kind of like appeasing it <laughs> and being in alignment with it a little bit too. <laughs> All right, let us now move on to January 1st. Okay, January 1st, our balsamic moon enters the sign of Capricorn. So now we take one toe step back into the physical world with this moon moving into Capricorn. This is the pre-new moon phase. So, of course, we can do absolutely nothing here, right? <laughs> I, as I always encourage you every month, um, if you get a chance to, always take some time for yourself in these last hours of the moon cycle. And again, I know we live in the modern world, and so having a three-day retreat every single month would be lovely, but is super not realistic for lots of people. So even if that is a, a lovely bath with the door locked, even if that is like me with my headphones cranked up in the back of the bus you know, for an extra long ride, like whatever, whatever you can pull off. Um, this balsamic moon always, you know, when the moon is balsamic, it's always a, a good time to try to come back to our center. Uh, but if you do any magical work on this moon, it is a fantastic moon for taking a look at your life and thinking about the limitations that are on your life currently and really giving yourself a moment to do a deep dive on how you could surpass those limitations. Now, 
We don't want to get too fantastical with that type of thinking, but we also don't want to completely let go of the Sagittarian fantasy that we've been having for the last two days. Um, you know, Capricorn wants pragmatic, it wants practical, it wants structured approaches to things. So we want to keep our list realistic, but Sagittarian is like, I can see off into the distance. So we also want this list to be challenging. In what ways can you challenge yourself in this coming year? Now, again, I am saying this within the context of the worldwide panini, right? <laughs> like I'm, I, we're not, not there, right? That's still happening. So, you know, we might be talking about uh, challenges that are really tiny, right? <laughs> we might be going for like a 1% improvement, but that's something. That's, that's something. That's something to celebrate. Again, remember our balsamic moons are so helpful for us to see into the future. And this is New Year's, right? Um, so we have a lot of things helping us here to come up and stand up on this high plateau, as I was saying before, um, and look out over our lives and make a contract with ourselves to try to do better, not more, better, right? Again, that idea, going back a few days to the, to the Mars-Saturn conjunction, what am I putting my energy and time into? What deserves my sweat? What deserves my tears? What deserves my money? What deserves my investment? But let me refine that conversation by pulling out all the stuff that doesn't. Now, again, you know, I, again, we're, we're within a context. I am not saying this in a, <laughs> in a like, oh, guys, it'll all be great in this coming year. Don't worry about it. No, like it's we're still in it. It's still tough. It's still very, very difficult. But I want you to be brave and bold after all of this work of this week of really considering like, what am I thinking about other people and where they've been? Oh, wait, where have I been? Oh, wow. Okay, maybe some other people have been through some gnarly shit too. And, and what is the holy version of all of that? And can I hold on to that? And now Capricorn is like, and can I embody it? Can I manifest it in the world? And Capricorn is the long view. Capricorn is not worried about making a goal for next week. Capricorn's like, let's talk about 10 years from now. What's the arch? What's the arc of the thing that I'm trying to do? That stuff. That's what's up with this moon. Okay. Um, when we have our moon in Capricorn, we are resting, relaxing, restoring, or otherwise nurturing or resting, you know, bringing in um, our skeleton in particular, our skin, our nails, our hair, our teeth. Those are all the things that are sort of ruled by Capricorn. And for our plant work, we are dealing with structures for our plants. So do our garden beds need attendance? Uh, do, the, do our fences need attendance? Do our rock walkways need attendance? I live in an apartment, so I don't have any of this stuff. But do you have window boxes where you grow things? Do they need some sort of attending? Do they need maintenance of some kind? This is all very Capricornian in, a, in its work. Okay, so that's what's up with this Capricorn moon. Now, let us get into the astrology of this day because we do have a bit. So, first up, we have the sun in Capricorn, trine Uranus retrograde in Taurus. This is Earth-tastic, obviously supporting uh, this vision work that we're doing with our moon moving into Capricorn. We're going to have a new moon in Capricorn here in just a second. Um... So this is very much the preamble to all of that. So what are we doing with the sun and Uranus in Capricorn and in Taurus? This is an incredible transit for engaging in new activities and making discoveries about yourself and the world 
around you. Are you kidding me? It's so in alignment with all this other stuff about Ah, oh, it's so good. I love it. I love it. Oh, okay. <laughs> Obviously, this completely supports our moon and Capricorn work that we are doing as well. Your perception of yourself is super real and grounded on this day in the best of ways. You see yourself for who you are, and you absolutely are being super realistic about it, but you are also in this very loving stance with yourself. No aspect of yourself is hidden today. You are quite frank with yourself about who you are, your understanding of your world and your place in it can help you make the adjustments that you need with a total understanding of how the various parts of your life are interrelated. This is also a great transit for studying any discipline that can reveal new and stimulating aspects of the universe as well. So really complimentary to all of this other work that we're doing across the week. Just love it. Also on this day, Mercury moves into Aquarius. And it's only going to be here for like three-ish weeks or so. It's not going to hang out here for too long. But this whole transit encourages independent... Oh, that's right. Actually, <laughs> we have a Mercury retrograde coming up. I lied. We're going to be here for a little while. Okay. <laughs> you heard it here first, folks. Okay. This whole transit encourages independent and progressive thinking and communication. Again, we love this with this, you know, vision moment that we're having about what are we doing for this coming year? Where are my, what are my patterns? Where am I at? What am I investing in? So now this Mercury in Aquarius is like, let's be independent. Let's be progressive about what we're doing. Um, and you know, side note, as the nodes are just about to move out of Gemini and Sagittarius, I think this moment of Mercury hanging out in Aquarius is a really cool transit that can give us a, a wonderful reflection period for what we have learned about information and information sources, right? And how that affects our community and all of that stuff. As well, this transit encourages inventive thinking, especially helpful as we step into New Year's. Okay, that is our lunar work in astrology for January 1st. Now, let us move on to the holy days. Okay, holy days of January 1st, here we go. <laughs> First off, between January 1st and 5th, we have the Quadrantids Meteor Shower. The Quadrantids are usually active between the end of December and the second week of January. They peak around January 3rd and 4th. And this year, that's awesome because we have a new moon on the 2nd. So if your skies are clear, you are probably going to have a really great opportunity to see this meteor shower and that's a fantastic time for doing any kind of star magic or wishing magic. Uh, unlike other meteor showers that tend to stay at their peak for about two days, the peak period of the quadrantids lasts a couple of hours. <laughs> um, you can find these kind of radiating out from the constellation uh, booties or booties. <laughs> okay also on this day it's New Year's Day. Okay. Uh, running from January 1st to the 6th from our Slavic friends and ancestors, we have the Days of Wolves. This day or this festival is connected to the god Dazbog, who we talked about quite a bit earlier in the year um, and is part of a triplicity of gods that the Slavs work with. Um, and this is basically a celebration of the cult of the ancestors. It's believed that souls of our ancestors or the souls of the dead briefly come to visit in the form of wolves. During this period, wolves are praised more than anything, up to the point that our ancestors even made sacrifices to them. Sacrifices were mostly in the form of mutton or bread, but sometimes even other animals. In this way, uh, the wolf is invited in to eat with you and to try to, and this is ultimately to try to earn the wolf's favor so that it will not come back during winter to kill uh, your livestock. This day is also listed on some pagan calendars as being celebrated in November. So I found a few that listed it for November and I found a few that listed it in January. Take your pick. 
Also on this day from January 1st to 6th is Oshogatsu from our Shinto friends and ancestors. This is uh, the Japanese first day of the year. The people will partake in things like purification, passing out cards that wish people good luck in the new year, um, visiting shrines, drinking a very specific drink that's called Amazake, um, and specifically eating Toshikoshi soba, soba noodles, excuse me, Toshikoshi soba noodles. And they are supremely long noodles. And the idea is that the noodle stretches from the last year over the New Year's into the new year. I love that so much. <laughs> I was like, ah, I love it. <laughs> I'm eating New Year's noodles for the rest of my life. I love it. I love it. It's always black eyed peas for me, but now this year it's noodles. Also on January 1st from our pagan friends and ancestors, we have Hags Day. And this is a day that also has multiple days. So I do find this on pagan calendars for January 1st. And I also find this on January uh, 14th or 15th, which would be in alignment with the um, full moon of that month, right? We've, we've talked about that a lot. When things are gravitating to the 14th or 13th, 14th or 15th of a month, they often are meant to be placed on the full moon of that month because the 13th, 14th and 15th days of the lunar cycle coincide with the full moon. Okay. The hag, of course, is the crone. Um, and we see the crone goddess, of course, has completely stepped forward and is the foremost version of the goddess that pagans are working with uh, during winter time. You know, not universally, but for lots of folks, that's the truth. Also on this day, from our pagan friends and ancestors, we have the day of Ishtar. Again, this is another day that is uh, found in modern pagan Wheel of the Year calendars. I don't necessarily have a marker for this from our ancient uh, Babylonian Sumerian type folks. Um, but we have had lots of other stuff this week or a few other things this week point to Ishtar, including a fixed star that was supposedly connected to Ishtar. So perhaps this is the day of Ishtar. Why not? Uh, pretty much every other deity is being celebrated on January 30 or December 31st or January 1st. So sure, Ishtar too. Why not? Okay. <laughs> From our Catholic friends and ancestors, we have the Solemnity of Mary. Um, this is part of the 12 days of Christmas Catholic festival cycle. Um, the Catholic Church celebrates a lot of important feasts during this time, but none are as important as uh, the Solemnity of Mary. And it basically is just saying Mary is super dope and really, really fancy. She's extremely fancy. That's really what the holiday is about. It was taken out for a while. And then, you know, several hundred years later, the Catholics were like, no, this is important. We have to do this. Okay. Uh, also on this day from our friends and ancestors in Santeria, we have the Feast of Elegua. Elegua is sometimes represented as a child and sometimes as an old man, very appropriate for New Year's. He represents the beginning and the end of life and the opening and the closing of paths in life. Sometimes known as the trickster, he likes to play jokes on people. He enjoys candy and toys. Despite his childlike nature, he is extremely powerful. He is one of the warriors along with Ogun, Ochosi, and Osun. Elegua is always mentioned first in any ceremony because without his permission, the doors to communication with the other Orishas stay closed. So again, makes perfect sense that one of our very first deities being honored on the very first day of the year would be Elegua, who opens the way. Um, okay. Traditionally, the 6th of January, as well as the 13th of June, um, are recognized as holy days for him in Cuba. Also on this day from our Yoruba friends and ancestors, we have the face, the feast of Odudua. Uh, this is the creator of earth literally came down. His brother was supposed to do it. I believe his brother got drunk or was otherwise disposed, <laughs> indisposed. And Odudua was like, all right, I'll do it <laughs> and did it. <laughs> and you know, calamity ensued, but it was fine at the time. Also on this day from our Orthodox Catholic friends and ancestors, we have the feast day of St. Basil. This is another saint who is extra, extra sainty. He sainted real super hard. Uh, he was extremely fancy and also um, very saint-like. Uh, and that is about all the information that I have about St. Basil.
moving on to <laughs> uh, our last holy day of mention for January 1st, which is Siwa Ratri from our Balinese friends and ancestors. Siwa Ratri, often referred to as the Night of Siwa or Shiva, is an auspicious time for introspection and meditation during which the Balinese pray for forgiveness of their earthly sins and for support and strength from the god Shiva in order to reach their higher selves. Part of these rituals involve fasting and staying awake all night. So Siwaratri is also known as the longest night. Siwaratri is celebrated during the new moon of the seventh month of the Balinese calendar, and there are a series of ritual observances throughout the day. And as I said, the new moon for us here in Seattle um, is January 2nd, and so that's definitely rolling through for folks all around the planet. And that, my friends, brings us to the end of the week. All right, so carper carper Dirk, <laughs> I I I can talk. Okay, look, uh, I could re-record this, but I'm not going to. <laughs> so, what are our lunar phases for the week? Let's get into the wrap up. All right, we are moving from Libra into Capricorn. These are all cardinal signs, or Libra and Capricorn are both cardinal, and so we are moving into the initiatory energy of cardinal signs with the start of winter and Yule and the new year. They're all here to help us with that. Um, what have we got going on with our astrology? Well, we have uh, Mercury in Capricorn, sextile Neptune in Pisces at 20 degrees on the 26th. On December 29th, we have Mercury in Capricorn conjunct Venus retrograde at 24 degrees. On the 29th, we have Mars in Sagittarius, sextile Saturn in Aquarius at 11 degrees. On the 30th, we have Mercury in Capricorn conjunct Pluto at 25 degrees. And on January 1st, we have the Sun in Capricorn trine Uranus retrograde in Taurus at 10 degrees. Also during this time period, we have on December 28th, Jupiter moving into Pisces for the first time in 12 years. And then on January 1st, we have Mercury moving into Aquarius. What have we got coming up for next week? Well, we have a big fat badonka donk dump truck of a new moon in Capricorn. That'll be super chill and casual, I'm sure, because we only have uh, Pluto in Capricorn and Venus retrograding in Capricorn, and also the sun is there, and yeah, I'm sure it's fine. Uh, what else do we have going on next week? <laughs> um, we have the sun conjunct Venus retrograde in Capricorn next week, so really bringing some emphasis to that Venus retrograde process that's happening. Um, yeah. I think that's all I want to talk about for next week because uh, I'd rather just save it, you know, for next week. <laughs> uh, thanks so much for listening. Thanks so much for taking this trip with me this year. Um, when I say that this podcast has been therapy for me, uh, I am not exaggerating. It's not hyperbole. This really has helped me stay sane and grounded um, to have a, uh, something <laughs> to to force me to come back to the physical world every seven days. Um, it has been very affirming for me. My spirituality and my magical practices have always been for me, about me, from me to me. They have been about my spiritual exploration. I haven't ever been trying to tell people how to think <laughs> or what to think. Um, and at the same time, I am, uh, trying to come into the uncomfortable place of recognizing that w some of the things that I do and some of the things that I say, and some of the things I believe do have influence on people and they want to hear about it and they might even try it out for themselves. Um, I guess my meandering point here is Thank you for listening and thank you for supporting me in this exploration and in this growth. Um, I have gone into a lot of places that were very scary for me this year. And uh, 
I appreciate you holding my hand as I did that. Uh, I hope I can return the favor. I hope I am returning the favor. Blessed be heathens. Happy New Year's. Let's fuck shit up in 2022. Hmm? Hmm.